membership. Um, boy, is this next week's panel? We, can have, we should we should have uh, next week. We should get we, soon. We should get together and have this panel on the, on the future of the SCO because I think it is really really interest really really interesting. I. I mean, what has, what has been blocking the SCO, I think, from being more active on both the economic front and the security front, I think, is, has been fundamentally Russian insecurities about the organization being dominated by, by China. Now, with the new members, just with the India and Pakistan, I mean, that, that goes a long way, I think, to diminishing, diminishing that and opening the door for the SCO uh, to become a real player on both economic and security issues uh, in, in Eurasia. Uh, if we look on the, on the security side, I mean, everybody uh, in the region, the Central Asians, the Chinese, the PACs, the Indians are, well, the Indians certainly are, you know, concerned about the post-2014 uh, Afghanistan environment and what and what happens there. Um, traditionally, the the Chinese have been reluctant to play more of a of a role in Afghanistan, but I think there, I think what's been blocking them has been the sense that well, this is basically Washington's game, and so let Washington deal with it. Well, now we're, you know, we're making it pretty explicit that it's not going to be Washington's game. Uh, and uh, I would expect that the, that there's, um, that the SEO uh, I mean, seems to be the, the natural lead organization that would, that would play more of a role there. Uh, now the question is whether the, you know, the, the problem in the, in the organization are the, the mutual animosities and distrust amongst the members of the organization itself, I mean, starting with the China-Russia relationship, which is very ambivalent, the India-Pakistan relationship, which is not quite so ambivalent, um, not, to, <laughs> not, 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 not to speak of the, of the Central Asians' relations amongst, amongst themselves. So I think, I think to get back to your question, um, I mean, it is the, it is the, the, the mutual the distrust and problems in the bilateral relationships within, amongst the members of the organization themselves are, the, are sort of the biggest obstacles that prevent the organization from being much more effective. But I see the increased membership, you know, helping to mitigate that to some extent. If I could actually just jump in on this really quickly. Um, you know, the SCO is, an is a mu big multilateral organization, but in a lot of ways it's also an umbrella for bilateral relationships among its members. And I don't think that that's gonna change. In fact, if anything, if you have a much bigger, broader SCO that includes countries that have widely divergent strategic perspectives in some ways, I think that bilateralism at the heart of it is just going to be reinforced. Um, now, what does that mean in terms of the effectiveness of the SCO as an organization? I think that's a question that is definitely um, out there. You know, the, from the Chinese perspective, I think there are, there are growing security concerns related to Afghanistan, but also related to Xinjiang, uh, where there's been an upsurge in violence in the last year or so that uh, is leading policymakers in Beijing to, to pay more attention to what this organization potentially can do, uh, not only in terms of China's economic interests in Central Asia, but also in terms of these security interests. Um, but whether it'll be able to, you know, manage these, these mutual rivalries, not only uh, between Russia and China, but between India and China, between India and Pakistan, uh, that's going to be a big question. Um, let's get back to energy. Are there any more questions uh, out there right now? Uh, yeah, Anna. Wait for the mic. So Anna Oslund, um, I'm a consultant called Oslund LLC. I'm just flying from Kiev, so security is on my mind. And uh, you mentioned uh, Russian insecurities regarding China. Mr. Ito said about paranoia. So I wonder, these um, cartoons that were popular after this signing of the agreement between uh, Russian and China leaders, Krim Nash Sibir Vash, it's like Crimea belongs to us, Siberia belongs to you. 
uh, that's how Russians interpreted it. And I wonder how much uh, substance is there or is just pure paranoia, how much of Chinese ambition of those really empty uh, between us <laughs> territories of Eastern uh, Siberia, given that the population is 10 times. Um, <laughs> thanks, Anna. That's a great, great, great question. Uh, I, th I think, um, you know, <clears throat> many, many, I mean, th there is a, a traditional, I mean, my dissertation was on Sino-Soviet relations, so I've been studying this relationship for pretty much all of my life. Um, not to say, not, not, that doesn't mean that I actually learned anything useful. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you what I what I, I mean hearing for you know 15 or 20 years you know Russians express you know concern about uh, the rising power of China my response to that has been typically well I think actually what you have you have more to fear than a rising China would be a weak China um, you know with a with a China with a growing economy uh, strengthening China, you know, what is, you're not going to see millions of Chinese come across the Russian border to Russia. Uh, I mean, the economic attraction is simply not going to be there for those, those large numbers, which is the visceral fear. It's almost as though, you know, Genghis Khan is, you know, waiting there with his, you know, thousands, millions of, of horses ready to come across the border and rape and pillage. It's right there in the frontal lobe. I mean, it's, it's a weak China where actually Russia would be, look more economically attractive and then China would be less able to control the border. But to me, that would traditionally be, be uh, uh, a, a, bigger, a bigger concern. Um, and then secondly, there's the question of, well, oh, okay, once, once China finishes, you know, with its territorial ambitions and with Taiwan and the East China Sea and the South China Sea, then it's going to return back to the, the territories that were uh, taken by the Russian Empire, especially in the 19th century, but not only, uh, you know, via unfair treaties, which Russia took advantage of the Chinese Empire during a period of historical weakness and annexed, you know, huge amounts of territory. And my response to that is, well, that's why you keep nuclear weapons. Um, it's not, but it's, but the, that it's not, it's really not the, so it's not the military threat that I would be concerned about, but it would be the leverage, the long-term leverage buyout. And so the Chinese, um, and here, if you're, you know, I think it was the global financial crisis that the Russians started to wake up to some extent that, you know, maybe the unmitigated growth of the Chinese economy, where the Chinese were clearly the, the, the winners, is not necessarily, uh, I mean, a great thing for Russia necessarily, and that Russia's game should be to, to create a diversity of investment partners for Eastern Siberia and the Russian Far East. So they are less dependent from being over leveraged to Chinese Chinese capital, um, but then that would require. And you know, Mr. Putin has talked about this going back to when he first came into power. That when he was in Blagoveshensk, I think in 2000, 2001, he made the reference that well, you know, we have to be concerned about you know people speaking Chinese here. Um, well, if you're re if you're really concerned about concerned about that then what you'd want to do actually is to improve your investment environment so that uh, more players are attracted to investing into the, into the region and so that you're not beholden uh, to the possibility if China were to be the, um, the one buyer, so to speak. Okay, uh, let me endorse what uh, Andy has just uh, explained in greater details. Well, I'm the person who spent as many as three years in Havaros, the Far East, as a German while I survived. Well, I have to say, why they love Japanese? Because just because Japanese are not Chinese, I'm not saying good or good or bad, it's a different thing. This is just the comparison. 